Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show one of our favorite guests, the amazing Lynette Zhang. Lynette is the Chief Market Analyst at ITM Trading. She is one of the most popular financial commentators today. Lynette is an expert in money, precious metals, fiat currencies, cryptos, governments, and the stock market. She is a voice of reason and truth within an economic world which is spinning out of control. Lynette, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm very happy to be here, Michelle. Thank you for having me on. Oh boy, we are welcoming and thrilled to have you back to the show. This is going to be an amazing interview because Lynette, I want to start right off with this new digital money currency system, mm-hmm. because this is something which you have been talking about for a long time, and yes. it is rolling out yes. right under everybody's noses. Um, it seems to be also the end of freedom in the yes. way that we spend our money. This is very scary. Most people are not even looking at it that way. They don't understand the control factor, which this is going to give to the very organizations, which everyone has been complaining about in terms of manipulation through every market. So let's go into this. It's very interesting that no one is talking about it. Um, I really want you to go into depth with us on what this means. How did it start? Who is really behind it and what could it mean for our future? Okay. I mean, really, I think it's great to go in depth and start at the beginning because people don't really even understand money. And that's why these things can happen so easily. But we needed money so that we could specialize. You would have a farmer, a baker, a lawyer, a banker, etc. And money is a tool to value your labor. So when we were on a gold standard, you were really trading your labor for someone else's labor. But it created challenges for governments who wanted to tax and spend. And so they brought in, and for the first time gave them an unlimited charter, the central bankers. But bankers have been around forever. And what do they say? I I care not who makes the laws. Uh, It matters, and I know I'm butchering that, but it matters who issues the currency. And they're absolutely right because that's who controls the purse strings. And so we went into what's called a fiat system, which is a government-based system. Now, while we were still on the gold standard, if you didn't like what the politicians were doing, You had gold and silver certificates. You could go into the bank and pull that out. So the so the population had control. And since it was really physical gold and silver, if you held that or even the gold certificates, frankly. But when you held that, you had absolute privacy. So on a gold standard, it is the citizens that have control and they can control their privacy. That didn't really work well for governments and central bankers. So they transitioned us onto a fiat system. The literal translation is by decree, but it's a monetary, it's a government-based system. And in this system, we probably all realize this by now, it's really all about debt. Whereas gold was a saving system, this is a debt system. And in this system, if you took dollar bills out of the system, you still had privacy, but the central bankers controlled the value. And the time that it would take from the time that they made a policy for it to trickle through the banking system and to see if it actually worked was roughly 18 months. That's kind of a long time. Now we are transitioning into a digital system that while they will still use the banks because the banks have the relationship, FinTech, you know, the financial technology, they have the data. So we're seeing a marriage, which is also something I spoke about a few, a number of years ago, that we would see a marriage between the two. We're seeing that 
and all under the auspices, <coughs> excuse me, of the central banks that will issue both retail, meaning you and I will have an account, the Fed now account in the US, uh, but you and I will have an account directly tied to the Federal Reserve, as well as wholesale that would go to the commercial banks and fintech companies, etc. And the problem with the digital currency is that it is programmable. It's programmable money. And if everything is held inside of the system, then you're not in control at all. I mean, dollar bills, you take them out, they do not protect your purchasing power, right? I mean, we know that there's virtually no purchasing power left. And if you go on the Federal Reserve's Fred and look at purchasing power of the consumer dollar, what you will notice is that the dollar officially is losing purchasing power at the fastest rate that I've ever seen it. Okay, but at least you can protect your principal. Once we are in this digital system, there's no way, if, if all your wealth is held inside of that system, there's no way for you to protect your principal. That's what negative rates are about. Attacking principal, because there's no purchasing power left. So that makes having gold and silver that truly is out of the system and in your control, I mean, they can control the spot markets, those are contract markets. However, ultimately, because even when we move into this digital system, people will think, oh, that's the reset. It's not the reset. I'm telling you right now, it's not the reset. It's a step toward the reset because it gives them a lot more control. But from everything that I have read and seen, what still justifies the issuance of these digital dollars is debt. So they've got to get rid of the debt first. You know, this is one of the scariest propositions that I think yes. I um, can imagine. Yes. Because with a digital system, everybody's bank account with all this digital money, I mean, you know, if you do something wrong or they decide, somebody decides that you've done something wrong, whether you've done it or not, this is what's the scary part, whether you've done it or not, if someone behind the scenes decides to take your money away, number one, how are you going to prove it? Where are you going to go? You know, it's it's that kind of, uh, that's what scares me about Bitcoin a bit. I'm a big fan of Bitcoin, but um when we're talking about transferring into a completely digital system, a lot of people say to me, well, Michelle, it's just like Bitcoin. You know, you're big on Bitcoin. You're big on Ethereum. You know, what's the difference between that? The difference between that is that's my choice. That's my choice. You know well, what I'm saying? It, 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 right? It appears to be your choice. Ah. It appears to be there. And, and, you know, that's called nudging. That's actually a real term for perception management. And it's called nudging. I, you know, personally, I read the 1996 NSA paper on how to create a mint, so how to create these cryptocurrencies. Mm. And I personally do not think it's a coincidence that Bitcoin magically appeared in January of 2009 and official quantitative easing started in March of 2009 and that that these cryptocurrencies were allowed absolute total free reign to get eyeballs on them, to get everybody comfortable with the digital system. Do you I'm think it's all government, Lynette? Do you think me? that do you think that the government is behind Bitcoin? and Ethereum and cryptos, because I'd like yes, to explore that. Okay. I mean, re read that NSA. NSA is a government agency and they wrote this paper in 1996. Okay. And if you read it, it's incredible how many similarities, even the verbiage, everything. I, so yes, I do. Okay. And I think that it was about getting us comfortable with it and used to it and getting it adapted. 
And if you look on the Bank for International, that's the Central Bank or Central Bank, if you look on their money flower, there is a small space on it for private cryptocurrencies. So they will allow some to survive. And I don't know which one that's going to be. I mean, it looks like Wall Street adores Bitcoin. So as much as everybody thought that it was outside the system and private and all that, I mean, Michelle, do you really think it's outside the system and <laughs> private and all that? You know, when we first, when it was first introduced, Lynette, it was the big thing, you know, Bitcoin and crypto and decentralization and getting away from the system. But the more I've learned and the more I've read and the more I've talked to experts, the more I've realized this is a government thing, especially with the, you know, the origin, you know, Satoshi, it's this big mystery. Who could it be? You know what I mean? Who could it be putting forth a huge monetary system? Right. Is it just one, you know, invisible person probably? Well, and and don't so, you have to give your social security and, and information oh when man, you buy? You have to jump all kinds of hoops for cryptos. I mean, know your client, so, you know. You know, I mean right. we have to we have to we get recertified every year. Know your client, you know, money laundering and all of that. ITM has been doing that way, way, way before it was even we were legally obligated to do it because we like to cross every T and dot every I. You know, we, we believe strongly in that. But so so the answer is yes, I, I 100% <laughs> think that this was, and look what it's done. It's taken people away from gold, which actually is really decentralized outside of the mm. system and needs nobody. And that, by the way, is a much bigger gold and silver commodity money is a much bigger area that is on that Bank for International Settlements piece, the money flower. Plus, it is the only area that is actually outside of the system, according to the money flower. And if it's inside the system, it's controllable to crash it. Exactly. It's controllable to do anything with it. Absolutely. It's you want it to sense. fly, you allow it to fly. You want it to crash. Well, you know, I mean, what's been happening in that space and look at China. I mean, this isn't the first time that China has controlled the crypto space. Oh, right. Right. Huh. Very interesting. That's so, a really interesting point. It, so I'm not <laughs> saying like, that it's not going to survive. <laughs> right. right. I'm just saying it's not invisible. It's not out of the system. And here's the other piece. It has, I dare I say it, and please correct me, because I know there is some level of functionality, but it has a very limited level of functionality. Oh, of course. Which means that you have a narrow base of buyer. Right? Gold and silver are used across the entire global economic structure, every single area, even food, right? Mm -hmm. The monetary system, manufacturing, medical, everything, art, jewelry, the financial system. So gold and silver physical in your possession has the broadest base of functionality and therefore the broadest base of buyer. And also in a recent Bank for International Settlements piece where they were looking at foreign exchange and reserves, they made the, the conclusion, if you don't read any of it, you just read the conclusion and Edgar, maybe we'll send you the link so you can post it to make sure. it easy for your, for your viewers and listeners. Yes. But the key that really got me is them, the Bank for an International Settlements stating that gold is the only financial instrument that runs no counterparty risk. And if held in your home, runs no political risk. Voila. Ooh. What do you want to own? Right. Right. I know you've always been a huge fan of precious metals and um, yeah. gold in particular. Um, what are yeah. your thoughts on silver, Lynette? 
Well, silver is the secondary monetary metal. And, you know, the reason why I've always been a big fan is because I have been, I've been studying currencies and currency life cycles since 1987. I've been a banker. I've been a stockbroker. You know, uh, frankly, I started in this area on some level when I was 10 years old. So 1964, when it was still illegal to own more than five ounces of gold. And I'm so grateful to my Uncle Al who showed me the benefits of owning not just gold, but gold in a form that you that there was an unlimited amount of what you could own. So the pre-33 coins. He had two full safes that you couldn't fit another coin in there when it was illegal to hold five ounces. But as a student of history, and certainly as a student of currencies, I mean, frankly, everything has a life cycle. I mean, my, my grandson just turned eight. I guarantee you he is at a different point in his life cycle than I am at 66, right? Everything has a life cycle. Currencies are no different. And really, I also talk a lot about patterns and recognizing the patterns. So the reason why I've always been a huge proponent of having gold, and even I was there on Black Monday in 1987, and even before that, I was a new stockbroker at Shearson. Mm. You know, I would tell my clients, even though that was not what I would sell, but I would tell them they needed to have some physical gold and silver outside of the system, as well as other stuff. But um, it's because governments destroy the value through inflation because, again, perception management, they create nominal confusion. So if you had a, oh crap, if you had a $20 bill six months ago <laughs> and you've got a $20 bill today, everybody now can see that that $20 bill, it's identical, right? They're both $20 bills, but it buys you a whole lot less. In six months, well, as you just said, I mean, it's the gas, food, you know what I mean? You literally can buy, you know, you could buy four times as much six months ago. I'm just, just to illustrate your point. I mean, it's so clear in front of everyone. And you know, what's interesting about the inflation is that um, basically politics and the federal reserve are transparently one because all of the politicians, the administration, Oh, don't worry. We're going to offer we're, we're going to allocate trillions coming from the Federal Reserve in UBI. So you don't have to worry about inflation if you're seeing any kind of inflation. And all this is doing, Lynette, I mean, you know, it, it's a domino effect because everybody stays home. People who used to take a lot of pride in their job and moving up in their job now stay home because they've lost complete interest of that. They have this it's heightened unemployment, it's UBI that's coming, it's all these promises. And then what's happening is the administration, I don't know if you saw this or not, but he kind of whispered, um, they were like, well, they can't get people to come to work. Well, raise their, their wages. I hate it when he whispers, it's so weird. But, you know, raise their wages. But, you know, I mean, well, this, I don't know if it's uh, negligence or complete ignorance, but small businesses pay what they can in order to survive. Right. If they were to raise their rates and raise their wages, they simply can't survive. And so this is killing all the small businesses. They can't get employees. And this whole notion of, well, just pay us more is, I don't know what's going on, Lynette, if people are, you know, completely economically ignorant on how business works, but well, the impact. you know, there's business and then there's business, isn't there, Michelle? You know, there's big business, which is consolidated. And since inflation is based upon the products and services that they produce, right? Mm -hmm. That's what's enabled the income and, and wealth inequality because the average wage never, ever, ever by flip and design keeps up with inflation. 
So then you've got the little mom and pops. Now, you know, I mean, I have been vocal about Amazon in the past. They're not the only ones, but since that kind of hit close to home in my family who had small businesses, I mean, I come from a very entrepreneurial family. Amazon, when it came in, didn't matter if they made money or not. Wall Street funded them and that became not just for Amazon, look at all the unicorns now, but Amazon did not have to make money. So they therefore had the ability to go in and undercut mom and pops and knock them out of business or force them to work for Amazon and create these, they're going, oh, all of these monopolies, which were enabled, encouraged to happen. And so we don't have choices. We have, we have the imitation of choices. But in fact, I just pulled that, that data. I, I don't have it in front of me. But it's like you go into the grocery store and you think you have thousands of choices. No, no, no. They're all made by three or four companies. You go anywhere you go, you go to the banks. I mean, the banks have, and now we're doing the FinTech thing, but they have been consolidating off the top of my head. I'm probably gonna butcher this, but there used to be something like, I think 256 banks. Now you have four banks that control something like 70% of the deposits or something like that, right? So. We only think we have, that's why, we only think we have choices, but we have no choices. This is why it is critically important, I mean critically important, to be as independent and self-sufficient as you possibly can be. And that means food, water, energy, security, Barterability, there's silver, we'll come back to that. Wealth preservation, that's gold. Uh, community and shelter. Because regardless of how much money you make or you don't make or, or what have you, these are the things that we all need in order to be comfortable and have a reasonable standard of living. And we got a little taste of that March, 2020. When the grocery, I mean, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but who couldn't see this coming? It's so fragile. The supply chain, the supply chain, right? But it, it was, it was the supply chain and the demand surge, and so I had plenty that I was able to share, and I think that's also part of the community. But you know, toilet paper. Oh, I'm awful because I'm hoarding toilet paper. Well. I think there's some people that were really happy that I had plenty that I could give them, you know, food, all of that. We need to do that. And for me coming on here is about building community because even though I say we have to be as independent and self-sufficient, we need those around us. We're not an island. And we need those around us that have different talents and different skills to come together to help each other so that we can get through this mess because there is absolutely and hasn't been absolutely zero doubt in my mind that we are and it shouldn't be a doubt in anybody's mind anymore that we are transitioning into a new social economic and financial system and we still have a choice as to how we want to go into that new system because we can't stop it. The old system died in 2008. And I'm sure you remember me saying that, yeah. you know, in that first interview. And all they've been doing is papering over everything. When you talk about the Fed issuing trillions, guess whose trillions that they're issuing? Our trillions, our tax trillions, right? So, you know, we need to. And we need to have real money that's outside of the system. For me, gold is about wealth preservation and opportunity positioning because it can maintain whatever you're holding in your cryptocurrencies or stock market. I mean, a trillion times zero is zero. So they make it look like it goes up, but in reality, what you can convert it into is going down, right? 
Um, so there's a way to balance that's called diver real, true diversification. That means you've got to have tangibles outside of the system. Silver for me is about barterability. So if I need to go put a tank of gas in my car or buy some strawberries at the grocery store, that's what that's about for me. So I have, you know, certain weighting based upon my current cost of living, which, I mean, I created a strategy based on my studies and it's just based on repeatable patterns. It's not rocket science. <laughs> It's, it's, it's actually pretty simple. And then everybody at ITM, I mean, we all, we've been together for m almost everybody there. We've been together for a really, really long time. And they all come from different backgrounds and we get together, we get together every week, but we work on this. So the strategy has just gotten better and better and better, but it's all, re it's all based on repeatable patterns to know, okay, well, What's the likely amount of silver I'm going to need to survive what's coming for barterability? And what do I need to protect my intangible assets? And then what do, it, it depends. Because the first thing you've got to talk about are your goals and then your circumstances and what you have to work with. And then based on those, you develop your own plan. And I think that's critical, it's critical. And it's critical to get it done as quickly as possible if you can't see the whole system falling apart. Because it's falling apart right now. Oh, yeah. You know, I think this is just such an incredibly important conversation. Yeah. This is it when it comes to conversations. And it's, um, it's really interesting to me to watch the chaos that's been taking place the last couple of years or so. Mm -hmm. We've got the riots, the, you know, the BLM, you know, everybody out chanting, all of the social uprising, all of the very strong opinions back and forth and black and white and up and down and green and red. When in actuality, this is taking place behind the scenes. And I don't know what, right? It, it's very interesting. This is one of the most um, world changing. We're rolling out a whole new digital currency. And um, I saw you mention, I can't remember where it was, but it was a couple of months ago where you mentioned the freedom of what we spend our money on mm -hmm. might even be curtailed. Well, look at China, because China is testing their digital currency, but they tell you, where you can spend it, what you can spend it on, and it has a it has a date, an expiration date. So you can't save it. You have to spend it. And I think China is really leading the way on how governments, you want to know how to control your citizens? Voila, here it is. Here it is. Oh wow. You know, I didn't even hear that part. Oh yeah. That, that's mind blowing. So it isn't something that might happen. And you might recall in our last conversation that in my research, one of the things that I saw that they wanted was for the title of all assets to be held in digital form. So there's your blockchain, there's all of that, right? Now they can break this down into itty bitty pieces because after all the World Economic Forum, you will own nothing and you will be happy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But since we have been trained to be a consumer driven economy, well, let's say you have a hundred thousand dollars equity in your house and now you go to the mall and all your financial, everything is held on your phone. I mean, how easy is that to spend? Right. And then you just start spending. Oh, I really want that blouse. So oh, it's only whatever. So I'll just and before you know it, somebody in China actually has the equity in your house and you volunteer heard it yeah wow yeah yeah because it's all digitally held and you are spending your physical assets yes in a digital way yes so at the end of the day guess what wealth never disappears it merely shifts location or ownership so if you have physical gold you get to have the wealth shift your way. I, personally, I want to be the one to own the assets. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, because if you're renting, even though, you know, they were but actually this, there was a lot of good stuff that I was reading. Um, so I, I could be off on this. I'll be, I'll be mentioning it. But uh, the large corporations, oh, darn, I wish I had that with me. But their profit margins used to be like in 19, early 80s was something like a 20, 26 or 21 percent. Now it's 50 on average. Now it's 56 percent. Well, yeah, because and the smaller corporations that started with them or the smaller mom and pops, their profit margins has gone down while the profit margins of the big. Well, why not? They have access to free money as yeah. much of it as they possibly want. It's all built on debt. And, you know, debt can definitely give you the semblance of wealth. But at the end of the day, when that debt gets called, you better be able to pay that bill. These are just such incredible points. And, you know, once you put your items into digital form, you are so right. It's so, oh. just think of your credit cards, how easy it is to spend. Oh, oh, you've got all this money, you know, oh, just a little here, just a little there. When you're spending your house and people are so into looking a certain way and they don't, oh man. Oh, wow. I'm telling you. I can you. see that rolling for like 80% of the people just snap without even thinking about it. Oh, I'm rich. Look exactly. I have all this equity. Right. You know, those are the ones that don't lose it, you know, in this next collapse. But let's yeah. talk about that before we go. I, I don't want to <laughs> I want to cover the next collapse. And I also want to, you know, this financial reset, you mentioned it's social, too, which really oh, yeah. struck in my mind. So talk, expand on that part. I can't prove this. So, uh, so I want everybody to know this is my opinion, okay? But I do think that the pandemic was very, very convenient. And if you look at how people interact with each other today, you know, you have the vax versus the no vax. You've got, you know, rage in airplanes or in stores. Oh, you're not wearing a mask. And I mean, socially, the fabric has changed dramatically, dramatically, you know, now it's great that people can start to go out again. And, you know, I did an event with George Gammon the beginning of June and again with Gerald Salente over 4th of July. And it was, both events were fantastic. And a big part of that was because it felt more normal, but it's a new normal. People hesitate to shake hands, they hesitate to gather, I mean, don't they? Yeah, they do. And I just, I, uh, I've never been a believer that this was ever real. I'll tell you the truth. Um, it just seemed so, you know, it all rolled out over the whole world at the same time. You know, I can't even organize a picnic, you know, you know, over the, I mean, for it to all roll out over the whole world at the same time, meaning shutting down all the businesses, all the banking exactly. going everywhere, governments. Exactly. You know, I mean, so this is, and this is not me saying this, although it's true. And and remember, cause I'm older than you. I was there in 19, in the 1970s and I was a teenager. So I was, I was not quite old enough to fully understand what was happening. But I was absolutely old enough to feel the energy and to watch all of the chaos around it that distracts you and pulls you. And that was also when we started shifting from being socially from having, you know, the and, you know, I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say it. Yes, please. I don't think how that <laughs> I knew it. But I mean, up at that up to that point, the average income was ninety five hundred bucks one wage earner could support a family of four. Now, I'm not saying they were super wealthy, but they only needed one wage earner to do it. So you had the mom at home, You typically the mom at home, and she kind of kept the whole family together as a cohesive unit. Well, after 1971, when we went purely on a debt standard, and part of it was to get the, the women 
to, you know, go back into the workforce, which I've always worked. My entire life I've always worked and, and my mom was a very strong woman. So it's not that I think that that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I just always think that it really needs to be a choice and not, uh, not you know, absolutely necessary. But what that did was we then created latchkey kids, right? And a completely different social system and we started to have a breakdown in the family values. And that started, you know, earlier too, where you used to have generations living in the household, right? So even if if you if you the woman or whatever was out in the fields working, you still had family there to hold it all together. So this has been breaking down like the monetary system way over time. Um, I'm nuts about my family and I'm really fortunate that they want to spend time with me. Uh, but I watch and I can see how addicted they are to the crappy food that they eat. I'm going to be honest about mm -hmm. it. Crappy food that they eat, which is not what I fed my children when I was raising them. And how much screen time they are on the computers. And this stuff is designed to be addictive. And so, yeah, we're going into another social regime, and I think it's another layer of the breakdown of the system because you can divide and conquer, right? Right. You're all together. You're coming together to make this, you know, to get through whatever. Again, I go back to community, community, community. It's probably the single most important thing in my mantra. Now, food... We can see globally and we can see it here. There is food typically becomes the single biggest issue during these monetary regime shifts, no doubt about it. And we can certainly see that happening. So you've got to do, you've got to do something about the whole mantra in order to be able to survive. So this is a historical pattern. Oh, yes. And we Absolutely. are in that monetary that. shift right now that is a classic pattern. So what we're shifting into, we have the choice to recognize what it is or to be forced into something that we're not um, looking at, basically, not taking into consideration. And yeah. I do think, right, that the distraction, this oh, distraction, yeah. I mean, of not just our country, but the entire world. Oh, this oh. is a global shift. Yes, yes, taking place. And people, you're right, the people against each other over a mask. Pe masks are supposed to be about, come on, but okay, about um, not, not breathing in. I mean, Lynette, you breathe through a mask. Anything that's microscopic, you know, in the air, is coming in and out through your mask, period. So what's the mask about? You know what I'm saying? I mean, to me, that was the first inclination in my mind. If you breathe, if it's, if it's microscopic, and I'm a meteorologist, I'm like a science geek. If it's a microscopic organism, supposedly in viruses, you know, they're not contagious, but let's just say they are. If it's microscopic and you're breathing it in and breathing it out through your mask. So right there, this is a, and what blows my mind is nobody questions it. Nobody says, nobody even researches it, you know, just because you're not, you know, into that kind of thing. Well, what does a mask do? You know what I mean? What does it stop and what does it function as? So my point is everybody just goes with what they're told. Which and, is, you know, I mean, they, do they know how to do it? You create a crisis. I mean, I, you know, traveled for those events and my daughter's wedding. So I have very lately been at the airport a lot. Oh. And every single time I had to go through TSA, they had to pat me down. Every single time. <laughs> it was, you know, and it's like, <laughs> and what's my choice? You know, I either did <laughs> not comment the there. It's like well, I mean, seriously, because I look so evil. Right? Certainly. <laughs> and the x-ray that forced me to go through, you know, I mean, what can I tell you? What can I tell you? But, you know, do I feel safer on the planes because I go through TSA? No, I don't. When did they install TSA? Hmm. The busiest travel day of the year. 
when they knew darn well that people would go, but I'm going for Thanksgiving to my family. Okay. So how do they get us to comply? They create what? What's that saying? Never let a good crisis go to waste. Right. Exactly. Um, there's a great crisis. They come up with a temporary solution that is always becomes permanent. Yes. Always becomes permanent. Social security, it was a temporary situation. It, become, it became permanent. That's what I'm thinking about, you know, these um, jabs. You know what I mean? It's a temporary situation, but it will come permanent. Before we close, I want to circle back to this new digital financial system, because again, yes. I think it is the one most Control. important topic that everyone, forget the BLM, you know, forget all of these anger about everything on the news. Look at what's happening because we are about to go into a situation where the same people that manipulate everything, the same bankers, all these evil bankers, you know, we're getting away from that. No, we're not. We're going straight into it. Right. And I think people need but to But with lots of data attached. Personal data. Correct. What you own and your physicality. Well, and, and tech and what your habits are and where you go and what you buy. And, you know, I mean, you know, the big tech has a lot of data on your habits, don't they? Right. So we're seeing a marriage between, and it, I mean, it was inevitable. Because FinTech has the data, the banks have the relationship, and the central banks control the banks. I think uh, Chase is, is in a big, huge buying spree, smaller FinTechs, smaller uh, banks, so that they don't run into, I don't know, whatever legal stuff they're talking about. Right. But, um, but yeah. So we've got this digital rollout, which you say is not the actual financial reset no what is the actual financial reset i know we're going a little bit long but i'm i've got to hear so okay. what what is it well the actual you know it's interesting because this is something that goes on constantly or this debate the reality is inflation resets the value of the currency constantly but if they can make that happen slowly enough it's the frog in the pot of water that's heating up you don't notice it but what people like to think of as the, of the reset is what's been happening in Venezuela, where they have had now they're going into their third reset, where they lop off a bunch of zeros and the currency is devalued by 95, 98%. And then they go into a new currency, they don't change any behavior, which is why I'm saying that this, when we first go into this digital system, that's not the reset because we have to feel a lot of pain. We have to burn off all that debt because from everything that I have read, that is what they plan on basing the, or justifying, I guess is a better way to put it, justifying the issuance of this new digital currency. And oh, by the way, they are talking about selling your data to help offset the costs of this so that they don't have to charge you for the currency. Oh, by the way. Oh, by the way. Yeah. I've done a lot of reading on this topic. A lot. This is and a I'm looking for, th for things like, okay, well, how are they going to justify it? In the current system, it's justified by debt. Well, since in the new system, that's what they're also talking about. I mean, I actually thought for a while there that it, that it could be a transaction-based system where if you buy something with a digital currency, that would automatically create more money. Just like when you buy something with debt, that creates more money. Mm -hmm. But no, they're talking about using the debt. So the reset is going to happen after a period of, you know, we're, we're, there's... I believe without a doubt in my mind, and maybe I'm wrong because this is beyond my control, but we are entering a period of a hyperinflationary depression. I disagree with the central bankers that these levels of inflation that we're experiencing are transitory. 
Some of them may be like 45% rise in used car prices. Yeah, but, but all they ever talk about are the percentage increases. Mm -hmm. Are the prices going to come back to earth? Well, they did with lumber, they can argue, but yet real estate prices continue to go up, right? right? So I don't think that the inflation that we're experiencing now is transitory. I think a few of them are some of the prices on maybe airplane tickets, which have jumped dramatically are. But I think that it's here to stay and I think we're at the start of the hyperinflationary process. And I think that we will witness the um, rate of inflation speeding up pretty dramatically. That's why the stock market, people will try and hide in the stock market. Maybe they'll try and hide in the crypto market. But what do you convert those assets into? Dollars. That's why you've got to have your gold. Now, I will tell you in my strategy mm -hmm. at one point, I thought, okay, once we, because usually a system on average will reset, do that big lopping off the zeros, a big dump three times, okay? I don't know how many times it's gonna take this time. But <laughs> usually people actually lose all confidence by the third time that they hear this time is different and they see that it's not, mm -hmm. right? Because behavior is not gonna change. So I used to think that once I saw, because this is also a historic norm, gold become a component of the new currency, that's when we will know that it's done. But at that point, all confidence in the system, in the currencies are lost. They have to put gold in there to generate confidence and trust and get the people to use the currency again. That's what over 4,800 times history has shown us. So I used to think that I would take, you know, a big chunk of my gold holdings and convert it at that point. No flipping way will I convert it, a, a big chunk, into the digital system unless I needed to pay for something. And then, which case, it's passing through the system pretty quickly anyway. So and take that, right. So that's how people have been able to protect their wealth for, you know, 6,000 years from the abuse of the governments and central bankers devaluing the currency, and it's still true today. That's how I intend to preserve and protect my wealth, my purchasing power wealth, from the abuse going into the system. Because 100% of the time, since you have the broadest base of buyer, right? There's always somebody willing to buy physical gold and silver. Right. So since I have that, I will, history has shown I will always be able to liquidate what I need to. I'm not going to do more than I need to, though. Beautiful. All right. So the bottom line is um, physical metals, precious metals, gold and silver, and um, self-sufficiency and community. Be sure that you have people who love you and you love them and you have your gardens and you have your heat sources and you have all kinds start to research because it wasn't 150 years ago that, you know, everybody, they heated their home just fine. They had their gardens just fine. They had each other. So this is not, as you said, rocket science. It's just something that everybody needs to really start to prepare for and have in their head that while we're watching everybody fight all across the world, there is a digital currency system starting to roll in and the people that are going to be controlling it are not you. <laughs> and they're not your friend. They're not your friend. My friend, the government. I'm your friend. I don't think so. I think we need to, you know, control it ourselves. And again, the, you know, the mantra, food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. And, you know, that may be overwhelming to some, but how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And you look at where am I most vulnerable? And then you start to plug those holes. 
and not everybody can certainly do a garden. I mean, if you're living in a high rise in Manhattan, you're going to have a little challenge with that. But you can buy, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple pounds of sprouting seeds and throw them in your freezer. They don't take up much space and then they'll hold and you rinse them off for three days and guess what? You got some live food. Maybe you can hold some beans and some rice, you know, right. and throw in some, a can of tomatoes and it's, it's pretty decent eating. So there are all different ways, no matter what your circumstances are, to get prepared for this. And that's what, you know, that's what we need to do. That's what we all need to do. We all the need to do The community piece is, is a critically important. Be, like, I, I know how to lay irrigation because there was definitely a time in my garden I was doing it all by myself. <laughs> and if I had to lay irrigation, I did. Is that something I want to do? No, I don't. However, if I needed to, that is a skill that is barterable. You see? So anything physical, anything physical, that's why you guys see me with jewelry. This is all barterable to me, right? That's the way I look at it. If I need, I mean, how did people escape from Nazi Germany over the mountains by having their gold and their silver and their jewelry and whatever had value sewn into their undergarments? And then if they needed to bribe somebody to cross the border, they had something of value to bribe them with. If they had a place to start, they had something of value because gold and silver in any form, doesn't matter what the form is, is monetary at its base. So this is, the, this is what people really need to understand and it's not just the gold and silver. It is your skill sets. Any, any, anything physical, any skill. Think of how much it could have gotten for toilet paper in March 2020. I tell you. <laughs> right? And I used, to, I used to say that. You know, even toilet paper when people thought it was crazy. I don't know why. I really don't. But that always seems to be something that people really want you know, when, when a crisis happens. So, so look at that and just, just start, go, where am I most vulnerable? And then that's what you start to plug those holes. And when you get to a level, that's how I've done it over, I've been working on this obviously for a long time. But when I would put that in, like when I first bought this property so I could grow food and it's an old property and there's a back door that anybody could have just walked up and kicked it in, done. So I felt really, really vulnerable. So the first thing I did was put in a security door there. Now I didn't feel vulnerable there anymore, right? right. So that's, what, that's the kind of thing that I'm saying, you know, if you don't have money outside of the system and maybe you don't have that much to work with, well, you can buy some silver. You can also yeah. buy some fractional, which are smaller pieces of gold right? Mm -hmm. They're severely undervalued anyway. Don't listen to the hype because when, let me tell you, when silver gets to be 600 bucks an ounce, you're not going to want to turn, you're not going to want to convert it into the dollars. Do you think it's going there? buy something with it. Lynette, right? do you think it's going there? Do you think silver's going? Oh, I think that'll be chump change. Really? So wh where's yeah. silver going and where's gold going? What do you think? Well, you know, he here's the thing. You're, you're thinking not in terms of nominal. I always think in terms of functionality. So would it surprise me to see an ounce of gold go to a trillion dollars? Heck no, because there's no value in those dollars. Would it surprise me to see silver go to 200,000 an ounce or, or a billion an ounce? No, because there's no value in those dollars. But what that silver and gold will always enable you to do is make sure that you have that food that you can pay those property taxes and you don't spend your equity, right? Right. It, it can help you, it can help ensure. So it's it's not about the number of dollars, $20 bill, $20 bill, right? right? Zimbabwe, they're billionaires, but they can't buy eggs. Right, 
Or if there's right. no eggs to be bought, you may be a billionaire, but there's no eggs to be bought. There's your vulnerability. You know, um, this is such an important point. Alistair McLeod said something to me one time. He said, Michelle, there was a point in time where you could buy a beautiful house in downtown. I forget where it was, what country it was, but they had just gone through an economic crisis um, with a piece of silver. Exactly. One piece of silver, beautiful house. That is my point. Because globally, on average, 25 ounces of gold or the equivalent would have bought you an entire city block, buildings and all. And so when I talk about the opportunity positioning, that's really what I'm referring to. Wow. And so this, you, you could really it, turn this into a really good thing if, if you look at this right. Oh, heck yes. Oh, heck yes. This is how wealth transfers. That's why I'm telling you, wealth never disappears. It just shifts location. So you want to be in a position to have it shift your way. And you do that by holding your purchasing power, real wealth. That's what the gold is about. It's protecting what you've accumulated. If you choose to keep it in there, which I personally have not, but it's also putting you into a position to buy that house with a piece of silver, uh, 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 you know, although it takes a lot, it's easier to carry a little bit of gold than buy the entire city block, right? <laughs> that, that's why I don't really think of silver in those terms because I need way too much to do what I intend to do. And for anyone that thinks that we're talking, uh, you know, just fantasy, it's happened over and over and over again. So this can either be a huge, horrible situation for people, or if you're positioned correctly, what's coming could really be a landslide for you. So prepare exactly. for it. You so, are amazing. Yes. Well, I just want to kind of conclude that thought mm -hmm. because my intention and one of my goals is to ensure ongoing choices and therefore I need a good wealth foundation for my children mm. and my grandchildren and my great grandchildren because what they have in mind for us is you will own nothing and be happy but they will own everything and get to dictate to you so if you want to make sure that you get to have your freedom and your control then you need to have physical gold, physical silver outside of the system. And then that's what puts you in the position, not just to survive what we're going through, but to thrive for the other side to come out the other side way better. Because you see all these crazy buildings that are going on. Well, that's all done on debt. And then they chop this debt up and they sell it to pension plans and mutual funds and all of this, right? So that at the end of the day, it's the little guy that eats it in the shorts anyway. But all of that property is coming back on the market. Right. Exactly. And what are they going to want? They're going to want something that's worth something. One piece yeah. of silver. Or at least... You know, because you, it, it depends on who you're buying it from. Mm -hmm. We'll determine that. But remember, you can always, history has shown us, 6,000 years of history has shown us that 100% of the time you can convert gold and silver into any currency. They can't always convert a currency into gold and silver. But you can always, always, always convert gold and silver into any currency. So even if you needed to buy that building and they were attached there somehow, you couldn't use that physical, I, I would say gold, okay? Because <laughs> uh, that's, that's the function for me. Um, but even if you couldn't use your gold to do that with, you convert it into the currency and it's done. Done and done. Just make sure you have enough gold for your property taxes because that's amazing. <laughs> right. Lynette, it's always so amazing to have you here. We must have you back much, much more often. Please tell everyone where to go to how to follow your work. Absolutely. Um, I have a YouTube channel and you can either search it through ITM Trading or you can use my name, Lynette Zhang. 
and also our website, itmtrading.com. And I'm, I'm not really quite at liberty to say, but all of the things on the mantra that I'm talking about, we've been working on providing more information on all those areas. And we're hoping to roll that out soon. Oh, so wonderful. You go to the website, we're soon. <laughs> We're close. It's We're behind close. the curtain and it's about to be exposed. It, exactly. Wonderful. <laughs> it's just like a lot of other things. Now, um, when do you think that might be rolling out? Just out of curiosity, because I know a lot of the stuff you've said today, people are August, like August, hopefully August 1st, but I don't, I don't know about that. But August, <laughs> fingers crossed. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Michelle. We should not wait this long. Absolutely. This is going to be great. We will have you back soon. Lynette Zhang, financial expert and chief market analyst at ITM Trading. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. 